Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. This is Mike Steckline from the Theta Care Center for Healthcare Value. I have a special treat today, a friend of mine, Ed Chaplin, uh, that I met a number of years ago when I was working at the Theta Care at the um, American Society for Quality. Uh, Ed was a, a um, chair of the healthcare division, and I was uh, working on staff, and uh, we met. And um, establish a friendship. I saw Ed present at the um, Deming Conference last July in Los Angeles, a really terrific presentation. So I asked him if he would present and he agreed to do so today. I've got the phones on mute for all of the attendees. You will be able to hear Ed and myself. Uh, we will have a process for asking questions later on. And uh, so you'll be able to do that. I'm going to transition now over to Ed, give him control of the computer. And um, Ed's going to take us through a, a terrific presentation. OK, can you hear me, Mike? Yeah, we're good. Go ahead, Ed. Uh, yeah, Let's close that out. So uh, a little bit more about my background. I was trained as a neurologist. Uh, Ended up spending a lot of time in rehab. That's where I, in a in a rehab unit, and then at a freestanding hospital. And currently, I work at uh, Scripps Health, uh, doing projects for the chief medical officer. So, uh, we're going to talk about uh, knowledge. And when it comes to that area, it's uh, clear to me that all I needed to know I didn't learn in kindergarten, and that uh, like a flat the belief in the flat earth, because that's the way it appears to the eye. Uh, there's a lot of neuroscience around uh, knowledge now that is, in a way, inconsistent with our common sense notions. So today I want to develop a biologically based understanding of uh, encoding and transferring knowledge. So uh, to set a little context, uh, here's a picture that we don't see things as they are, but as we are. And having uh, started in the neurosciences as a sophomore in uh, college at the Mass General and spent the last 50 years or so in that area, it's very clear to me that that's the way the world works. It's also clear to me that the rhinoceros doesn't see a horn, that uh, evolution would have taken care of that. Uh, another way of looking at is a quote from Marcus Aurelius, and you can see the person on the left is seeing four and the person on the right is seeing three, is that everything we hear is an opinion, not a fact. Everything we see is a perspective, not a truth. And what I've come to see is that every perception is a hypothesis, and every action we take is an experiment. So many of you are probably familiar with the ladder of inference popularized by Peter Senge and that group, uh, where our mental models and perceptions uh, affect how we observe and see data. And to get a sense of that, I'm going to give you a little exercise. So imagine uh, there's a field with some animals in it and 30 cows, 28 chickens. Who didn't? 30 cows, 28 chickens, who didn't? I'll give you a moment to think about that. 30 cows in the field, 28 chickens, who didn't? Now, when you do this in a group, uh, we tend to get stuck because we're hearing 28 chickens, because the context is 30 and 28. But really, it's 28 chickens, so 10 didn't. And uh, to me, that's an example of how we get stuck uh, as we have stimuli in a certain path of thinking. And uh, one criticism I would have about this slide is that it's overly simplistic. And if you really look at the neurophysiology uh, the actions, your beliefs, your conclusions, your assumptions, and even the process of selecting data uh, affect how, what you can select and what you can't select. Many of you have probably seen the, the, different, the, the figure, like, 
Is it a young lady? Is it an old lady? Is it a face or a goblet? So those are examples of even in the process of selecting data, our, our pre-assumptions affect what we see. Another example in vision, so the room looks square, but uh, these are actually twins. One's not a giant, one's not a uh, midget. And if you've ever seen this called the Ames Room, you, you know that the rooms are not rectangular. Uh, but those of us who grow up in, in societies where the rooms are rectangular see these illusions. Those that don't do not see the illusion. And uh, as Mike mentioned at the Deming conference, I spent about five or ten minutes describing how this actually works at the brain level. So we're biased, and we literally see the world through our, our presuppositions. So with that as background, uh, here is a problem. Okay, so this is a study, it's like almost 20 years old now, from a higher reliable organization, and I honestly can't remember if it was uh, the Navy or it was nuclear power, but I think it was one of those. And on the left, what you see is there are four experimental conditions, a control, a lecture only, a lecture and a demonstration, and a lecture and role pick up, playing. Uh, immediately, at the conclusion of this, people were given a questionnaire about what they were supposed to do in certain settings, and they scored on the one to six scale. And you can see there's really no statistical significance here. On the other hand, when they, they then took them into a room and they observed whether they practiced the behaviors that were presented on the left-hand side, and the only group that showed any change from control was really the group that uh, did the role playing and practicing. And so this is a, a problem in our thinking, and it's also a problem in a format like this because I'm talking at you. Uh, but if you really get the implications of this, uh, your world begins to show up differently, and you have the ability to be more effective in the world. And so most of the conversation today is going to be what is underlying or the background for this. We are complex systems. We live in complex adaptive systems. We're complex adaptive systems. And one of the characteristics of those systems are that symptoms and signs don't show up, often show up the same place. So here's a foot with some pitting edema. The problem is uh, rarely in the foot, unless there's local trauma, more likely it's uh, somebody with heart failure, somebody with uh, nephrotic syndrome, or somebody with cirrhosis. And so the theme today will be that many of our causes of the root QI challenges we have is an incoherence between our mental models of how we do what we do and our actual biology and social biology. So today we'll, we'll talk about some operational definitions. We'll talk about a knowledge cycle. Uh, by a Japanese uh, academician named Nonaka, and we'll do that at a high level. Then we'll go through the first part of it with some examples. We'll spend a good deal of time about uh, what we didn't learn in kindergarten. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the details of the cycles. There's a reference, and uh, going to spend more time on understanding the principles uh, because you can, read, you can read the reference. Then we'll talk about the second half, some guiding principles and questions. So Nanaka is somebody I became familiar with uh, probably around 2000. I was doing some work with uh, Yoji Akao, Dr. Jo Yoji Akao, who, for those of you who are involved in ASQ, uh, know the uh, prize named after him. Anyway, he was in Japan, a contemporary and uh, in, the, in academics and working with businesses when Deming was there. And he, sh he showed, me, uh, or showed me the model. And the concept of VAR, we're not going to talk a lot about VAR, but we're going to talk about the model in terms of socialization, externalization, combination, and internalization. OK, some operational definitions. What do we mean by knowledge? This is a, a set of distinctions that I've taken from Ross Acoff, another contemporary of Deming's. He defined data as observations things we can see from our five senses plus images, images that we draw, numbers, narratives, things along that line. 
Information would be contextual, who, what, where, when. Knowledge, which is what we'll be talking about today, will be the application of data or information or know-how. So knowledge is about know-how, being able to do, and understanding is about why. Uh, wisdom he described as evaluated understanding. So I may know how to build an atom bomb. I may know why it works, but wisdom would be whether I used it or not. And so we'll focus on these two today. And to get a sense of that, I'm going to show you a video. And uh, the sound's not great, so I'll stop it in a couple of places to uh, narrate it. But basically, uh, the person in the video presenting is going to describe uh, uh, the context for what we will watch. Hey, it's me, Destin. Welcome back to the party. You know what people say, it's just like riding a bike, meaning it's really easy and you can't forget how to do it, right? But I did something. I did something that damaged my mind. It happened on the streets of Amsterdam, and, and I got really scared, honestly. I, I can't ride a bike like you can. Before I show you the video of what happened, I, I need to tell you the back story. Like many six-year-olds with a MacGyver mullet, I learned how to ride a bike when I was really young. I had learned a life skill, and I was really proud of it. Everything changed, though, when my friend Barney called me 25 years later. We're up. So, so basically, he's making the uh, point, it's as easy as riding the bike. Like everyone else, that was a picture of his son. Uh, most people learned how to ride a bike when they were young. And uh, he's now going to talk about what a group of engineers did uh, they basically gave him a bicycle where the mechanism was re reversed. So if you turned left, the wheel would go right. If you turned right, the wheel would go left. In other words, the welders are geniuses, and they like to play jokes on the engineer. He had a challenge for me. He had built a special bicycle, and he wanted me to try to ride it. He had only changed one thing. When you turn the handlebar to the left, the wheel goes to the right. When you turn it to the right, the wheel goes to the left. I thought this would be so I hopped on the bike, ready to demonstrate how quickly I could conquer this. And here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Jesse Sound. First attempt riding the bicycle. Yeah, yeah I could do it. You can see that I'm laughing, but I'm actually really frustrated. In this moment, I had a really deep revelation. My thinking was in a rut. This bike revealed a very deep I had the knowledge of how to operate the bike, but I did not have the understanding. Therefore, knowledge, not understanding. Look, I know what you're probably thinking. Yes, he's probably just an uncoordinated engineer and can't do it. That's not the case at all. The algorithm is associated with uh, So basically, he was unable to ride the bike. He's using knowledge and understanding in the reverse way that uh, ACOF did. Uh, but we will use knowledge as know-how and understanding about uh, know what. So next, he's going to show, he challenged people to be able to do this on stage and was offering them a couple hundred dollars if they could ride the bike across the stage. It was riding the bike in your brain. It's just that complicated. Think about it. Downwards force on the pedals, leaning your whole body, pulling and pushing the handlebars, gyroscopic procession in the wheels. Every single force is part of this algorithm. And if you change any one part, it affects the entire control system. I do not make definitive statements that often, but I'm telling you right now, you cannot ride this bicycle. You might think you can, but you can't. I know this because I'm often asked to speak at universities and hospitals, and I take the bike with me. It's always the same. People think they're going to try some trick or they're just going to power through it. It doesn't work. Your brain cannot handle this. For instance, this guy. I offered him $200 just to ride this bike across the stage. Everybody thought he could. No, you didn't understand. Oh, <laughs> 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 
cognitive bias. But at this point, I'm pretty sure that all I've proved is that I can only redesignate that bias. So what you're not deep into this, because I've learned and unlearned. All right. After 20 minutes of making a fool out of myself, suddenly my brain clicked back into the old algorithm. I can't explain it, but it happened in a very specific moment. Uh, so anyway, <clears throat> the the point of showing that is it's a vivid example of uh, different sets of learning systems within the brain, and uh, we have a very rapid sensory memory, a short term uh, memory, and then a long term memory. So we'll be focused on the long term memory. So what the bicycle example shows, there's a difference between explicit memory, in other words, understanding what we were supposed to do, or have our knowledge, if you will, what what's supposed to do, is different than being the, the ability to do it. And it's, ten, it's called implicit memory. So when we're speaking about something, we're using an explicit memory system. When we're actually doing it, uh, we're using implicit memory system, which uh, Nonaka will call, call tacit in the figures. So tacit and implicit are, are the same. And what it shows is conceptual understanding does not allow you to, to execute on the process. That is really an unconscious process. And uh, explicit memory is further divided into episodic memory about your experiences and then concepts of facts. So today we'll be focusing on the difference between implicit procedural memory, skills, habits, and uh, semantic memory, or what we'll talk about as concepts. And this just shows you they come from different areas of the brain. So here we see in yellow uh, the caudate nucleus, the striatum, is where much of our learning occurs that's implicit. Some people call it muscle memory but it's really a brain-muscle relationship. And then conceptual memory where the hippocampus is very important. So in terms of guiding principles, we'll be using guiding principle in the sense that it's used within the network in that a guiding principle is a fact uh, that if you ignore it, there are consequences. So for example, there are consequences if you know that you ignore gravity. So for today's discussion, there are at least two different types of knowledge, and they're stored in different areas of the brain. Now, hopefully many of you are familiar with uh, the book by uh, uh, Daniel Kahneman. He and uh, Tversky have been writing about uh, how the brain works uh, for 20 plus years. And uh, this book summarizes a lot of their work in an easily graspable way. And basically, what he's putting forth in there is that we don't have one system of thinking or acting, that we actually have conceptually at least two. And the first would be a stimulus occurs, gets processed in the synapses, and we have a quick response. Uh, this is usually symbolized by a hare as opposed to a tortoise. But the rate at which we uh, operate in these systems is about the same speed as a snake strikes its prey or a frog zaps a fly. It's pre-reflective. It's fast. Uh, we go from generalized to whole, and we use a lot of shortcuts or heuristics. That contrasts to what he calls the slower system, uh, often symbolized by a tortoise, which is slow. It requires the work. We tend to be lazy. It actually requires more areas of the brain. And uh, since we show up in the, in the synapses of our brain, a lot of the time we're actually working on pre-reflective automatic. And so for an example might be you're driving the work. If I put uh, sensors on your muscles and, and, and monitor the movements, you're making dozens of movements per minute, all of that without thinking, responding to what's going on, subtle changes in the traffic. Where, and at the same time, you might be thinking about what you're going to do that day or what just occurred. And so we have these uh, two systems. So what we've built so far is that uh, two dimensions of knowledge, uh, reflexive, which is habit, procedural, deep in the brain, 
and reflective, which is, uh, requires more work and is slow. And this is not just mode of sensory. This also occurs in our thinking. And it's almost like uh, if you have an iPad or some tablet, you tap on uh, an, a, an app and it does its thing. And we do that even in our thoughts. And if you want to get some data on that, just go sit in the, sit in the meeting one time uh, over a problem that's chronic and see that the, the same people have the same responses over and over. And uh, that just uh, is reflective of our habits. Okay, so now another experiment. This one has no sound, so it should go much quicker. Uh, you are going to have to count, uh, and uh, your goal will be to count the number of times people in the white shirts bounce or pass the basketball. And if you've seen this video before, I would encourage you to uh, do the exercise again. Uh, because it's a little different than the older one that's out there. So again, your challenge is to uh, count the number of times the people in the white shirts bounce or pass the basketball. The people in the white shirts bounce or pass the basketball. Ah! <laughs> Wasn't supposed to stop there. Well, somehow it's, uh, it's running slow. Uh, if, if you've seen it before, in the middle of this, a gorilla walks out. And uh, for those of you who have seen it before, uh, recall that you probably didn't see it the first time around. And uh, that has a lot of implications about how our, our brain works. This time it's not going to stop and we'll go all the way through. Not quite. So if you've seen it before and you saw the gorilla this time, how many noticed the curtain changed and that one of the players left? Uh, so this is an example of uh, what's called attention blindness. And why I included it is to create the concept of niche and active interface. So if you look at a niche as being the relationship of the organism to its environment, both living and non-living, the interface is the actual part the organism is interacting with at that time. Uh, this video shows that the active interface uh, and the niche includes only what's uh, necessary for action. Since it didn't work, at the end there will be a, a link, a YouTube link, and I'd encourage you to uh, get some naive in the sense of somebody that hasn't seen the video before and run it and see for yourself uh, the number of things they don't see. So the importance of this is we're more in an action. We're only engaging in the active niche. So our tendency to put up a lot of signs and things like that uh, may not even we may not even be aware of when we're actually engaging in the action. So another guiding principle is if you want to change behavior by changing the environment, you need to make the changes in the active interaction in the active uh, niche. What actually people need to be attending to uh, when they're interacting. So to this point, we have uh, two types of knowledge. And uh, if you don't separate those two types, you end up deploying fixes that fail. The behavior that people are carrying out when they're engaged in an active uh, work on the unit tends to be by habit, not by reflection. And so if you want to make changes, you, need to, you, you, you will be more successful if you focus making changes on the active interface. OK, with that as background, we'll move into the modeled by Nonaka. And uh, this here symbolizes groups bound together in an organization. And if you consider you're going to take some ex external uh, articulated concepts, say like a best practice, 
and we, if you've been in healthcare for a while, you've had this experience with the core measures and skip measures. And then the challenge is to get this to be internalized into people, groups, and the organization. And then once it's internalized, it becomes the culture and the habit of the organization. So the difference between the concept and getting people to learn it and what changes occur here is that it, the knowledge is already socialized, so people coming in will learn in the physical proximity of what they're doing. So for example, uh, somebody that's onboarding or somebody in training that's doing a clinical rotation, uh, somebody that's doing a residency, that's different. That's, that's an example of bringing these people into a social environment and having them learn by doing because that's the habit that's in the environment. So then you may have uh, some very uh, high performing teams or individuals, individuals. So another source of knowledge would be to try to externalize that, externalize that in such a way that it can then move uh, to be spread to another area of the organization. So here in his model are tacit or procedural uh, knowledge, and here would be the explicit, and the cycle essentially takes uh, explicit knowledge, transferring it into a habit, and uh, capturing habits, making that explicit, so then you can spread it through the organization or to another organization, and this would be what he would call the knowledge cycle. So the components are uh, uh, transferring conceptual knowledge to practical knowledge, harvesting conceptual uh, practical knowledge to conceptual, and then the management of the knowledge cycle would be managing all those uh, around the organization. All right, so let's take a couple of examples. So again, uh, think back to the issue of core measures. We have best practices, or maybe a sepsis, which is coming online now. The challenge is getting that into the habits of individuals, small groups, and then uh, the organization as a whole, so that becomes the embodied standard work, not something that's written on a paper, but the standard work in terms of habits. So if you think back to the experience of uh, when core measures first came on board, uh, I, from most organizations I'm familiar with, the first strategy was to change people. The target was to change people by educating them, bringing, it, bringing them into a room or small groups or, uh, and actually uh, discussing what needed to be done, what the best practice would be. And uh, most organizations probably had this experience. This is all actual data from an organization, but uh, at least it occurs in many hospitals in our, our region. And I think th these are months, and I think uh, this starts around uh, 19, 2005. And uh, after many months of trying to educate, performance didn't change. This is antibiotic selection for pneumonia in the emergency room. And you see uh, performance to best practice was about 50%. It's not that 50% of the people didn't get antibiotics. They were either getting antibiotics that were more broad spectrum than needed to be used, which has the problem with resistance, or more expensive, which is the problem with value. And there actually were occasional uh, patients that didn't get broad spectrum enough. So this. Uh, why is this? Uh, what, is, what is the challenge that we face? And I've gone into that a little bit. So if we looked at this as a hypothesis, we were going to change people. We did not change people. Relies on explicit memory. Where really we need to be focusing on the active interface to affect habits that are embodied in the, in the uh, FAST system. Uh, in or we've spent and some areas still do, resources doing this for very little uh, benefit, but uh, the waste is not seen because uh, the cost, the true cost of doing this, both in terms of the time for people being offline or uh, doing this on their own, or the opportunity cost is not something that most organizations capture. So, we were doing this back in 2005. 
despite there being a lot of literature saying that it doesn't work. So in this slide, this shows a method of changing behavior. This shows effectiveness. Here are the number of studies. There's over 100 studies. And basically what they show is that taking people into a didactic presentation or informational mailing either has no effect or very little effect. This is about 85% of the studies uh, showed that. On the other hand, if you give them prompts and reminders and one-on-one -on -one meetings, I, that you get up around 80 to 85%. And again, we might ask the question, uh, why is this? And it shouldn't be surprising. Uh, in fact, it's a little bit on our part of cognitive dissonance that we know that logically we cannot, uh, we're not very effective at changing uh, habits around uh, cigarette smoking, alcoholism, a person with cirrhosis, or obesity. So if we were completely rational uh, animals, we would respond to logic. On the other hand, most of the science suggests that we're not completely rational. We're habit-based emotional beings who have the capacity to question and reflect. We just don't do it enough. Okay, so uh, Next, I want to talk a little bit about the learning curve. One of the things in learning a procedural task, whether it's riding the bike or changing how you do your admission orders or your post-op orders, is uh, learning. And learning revolves repetition. And we can see here, this is from primates, uh, where they had to do a motor task and then they got a response. You can see they spent one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, times just sort of trying to get what the insight is and then it takes off. This is a log from rats in the maze and it's the same kind of thing. So what is going on in the brain when all of this is occurring? And there are actually changes in the synapse. So if this on the left and the top is uh, where the message comes in, these little packets contain neurotransmitters, the message comes in, the transmitters are released, they stimulate receptors on uh, next to two here on the outgoing area. And in studies where you stimulate, uh, you can do these in vitro. Uh, most of the studies are in vitro, vitro, but there are now some in vivo. And you stimulate at a rate about one per, uh, one, uh, per minute and 20 to 30 minutes. You begin within a matter of minutes seeing a couple of things change. First. The number of vesicles that the cell is producing increases, and two, the number of receptors on the other side increase. And you can see here that the, the activation that occurs at this particular synapse starts going up. So this is something that can occur in a matter of minutes. Uh, for longer term, so, so if you do that and you only stop there, over a period of time, the, the uh, without repetitive stimulation, they tend to revert to the initial state. However, with repeated over time, you actually start getting changes in, in this, the architecture of the synapse itself. And this is done through gene activation. So with repeated stimulation, initially what you see is an increase in the number of uh, vesicles. And then uh, a message is sent to the nucleus. Nucleus releases messenger RNA, which starts doing some protein synthesis, and you begin to see these clefts, which you can actually see in photomicrographs. And uh, the, synapse, the synapse begins to split, so now you have double uh, the amount. And so this, take, this can take minutes, this takes hours. Does this happen in humans? Yeah. Here's an example from a PET study where people had to begin to recognize a pattern. And again, uh, learning in these settings require repetition. And uh, here's uh, from an MRI, not that, that particular uh, study, but another one where people had to learn a motor task. And you see here the uh, cerebellum. You compare here to here. In the, this is the initial state. A lot more brain involved, a lot less brain involved here. The somatosensory area. A lot involved, later a lot less involved. Frontal, a lot less. But these deep areas, the striatum we talked about. So as we learn 
a task, and if you remember back to when you first learned how to drive, you think I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. It eventually becomes automatic and efficient. And now when you drive, you're really not thinking about all the things that you're doing, nor is the clinician at the busy bedside stopping to reflect on whether they should be doing something different. They're dealing with the stimuli that are presenting to them and uh, trying to get through their busy day. Okay, so to this point, we've talked about two types of memory. Uh, procedural memory habits, we live, uh, according to the studies of uh, Kahneman and Tversky, we live a lot of our life and habit, and I've seen estimates up to 99%. Uh, and habits, you require repetition to create new habits, or you fall back into the old way of doing things. So now just a comment about systems two parts of uh, understanding systems. They're interdependent, so the behavior of each element has an effect on the behavior of the whole and vice versa. And then wholes and parts. Every part has properties uh, that it loses when it's separated from the system. And the correlate to that is every system has some properties, often essential, that none of the parts have. So I want to take that and uh, mold it into what we've discussed too far, so far. So these would be three different levels of systems. This is supposed to symbolize a cell with molecules, this is a body with uh, organs and cell networks, and this is our social organization. So if you understand systems, you understand that there is no cell in the molecules, that the molecules constitute the cell, and cells have properties that molecules do not have, uh, the molecules being a part. So most people don't have trouble with that concept. Uh, if we move up one further level, there are also no organs or cell networks in the cell itself. Those are a higher level of organization and a different dimension, uh, both physically and organizationally. Uh, so multicellular bodies have properties not present in cells. And the same thing occurs in our social dimension. There are properties in our social dimension that do not occur in individuals. And a very predominant one of that is language. Language is a property of the social group. Yes, we are able to speak, we have some encoding in our brain around language, but that came from our social interactions. Absent that social interactions, we would not have that capacity. Also, uh, what, we, what is often called the observer is really something that arises in our social dimension. Our ability to uh, think, our ability to conceptualize is really a function of our social dimension. Uh, so if you go back to this very first problem, when you look at conditions two and three, they were targeted at making change at the social level. Uh, just uh, getting people in the room and talking to them is about making change in the social level. On the other hand, when you have them get up and actually do the practices, you're making changes in the individual level. So uh, another guiding principle is look at the interventions and make sure they're directed to the appropriate dimensions of our biology. Sometimes we're trying to change concepts. This, so uh, two and three uh, are ways of beginning to do that, but there still needs to be repetition before it takes. If you're trying to change habits, you really need to be able to, to be changing uh, what people are physically doing in their environment. So if we go back to uh, the Nanaka model, if we take a systems approach and the primary intervention is to change the system, the people change the result, most organizations develop guidelines that were embedded in their pre-formatted orders. And when they did that, performance increased from the areas of about an average of 50 up to the 70 to 75. And you can see these were significant changes in the control chart. So here, the uh, hypothesis is we make a structural change in the system at the active interface will improve capacity and indeed the, uh, the uh, PK of the system went up. So the next thing we did is uh, back I was thinking, okay, well, I'll we'll just call the docs because uh, many of them may not be aware of the changes, the, that education doesn't work, 
mailers don't work, not everybody comes to meetings, and uh, that became a nightmare because it would take three to four calls back and forth before actually thinking. So what we did is we used an existing process, basically the peer review process, and we started treating misses in core measures as defects in care. And just like if uh, somebody left a sponge or something like that, or it was a bad outcome and the case was going to go to peer review, we started using that notification system. And when we did that, performance again jumped. Uh, we got up to a mean performance of about 90%. So the hypothesis here is if you use an existing channel to give feedback, you'd increase stickiness, the results were con confirmed. Uh, one thing uh, we learned uh, early on, not in this particular area, but in other areas, it's very difficult to build these channels to create an active interface. And uh, not only that, if you do, then you have a whole, whole process or system you have to maintain. It creates its own set of problems, and uh, if you have an assist, existing system that you can use, setting up another one is really uh, waste and adds complexity. A caution, though, is you can't use the same system for everything. If you put too much into it, then you're creating a lot of noise and it's going to lose its effectiveness. So uh, here uh, on the left, education didn't work, prompts, feedback, and then eventually if somebody wasn't responding to feedback, uh, you, uh, that was, uh, and, and how we did that is we actually send, uh, sent letters that were like somebody got a letter about a, a peer review case, the same way of doing that. And uh, if they didn't respond after two letters, there was somebody sat down with them. And that was one-to-one -one feedback. And if it continued to persist, then it became a, an issue of judgment on their actual performance. But feedback is different than judgment. And I think that's very important to get embodied in the culture of your organization because as physicians, I can tell you, any time, and for most clinicians, any time you're given feedback that your performance is not what you think it is, uh, it creates an emotional response and there's sort of a certain set of stages you have to go through to, to, to uh, get through that. Uh, just check a couple here. So, oh. Uh, Behavior is really, a, from my perspective, is a product of the system. And uh, if you want to change, uh, you have to change the system to get behavioral changes. And that culture is really an output of the system and uh, not, a, not a lever that you can change. You sort of change the culture one step at a time. And uh, our culture changed around this whole process. So the last, uh, measure that I was involved in at a, at, at a hospital site was the urinary catheters coming out within, within the second day. And so between two campuses, we had 65 surgeons who that affected, and there were only two physicians after we went through this process. And it didn't take, you know, a couple of years like this did. It took just a couple of months to get through this process. There were only two physicians that I had to sit down and talk to. And I could have told you who they were before we even did that. So this is much more of a re-engineering perspective. Uh, if you remember back the re-engineering wave in the 90s, uh, what they did is they changed the structure of the process, they changed behavior, and then people's belief systems changed uh, as a result of that. Whereas we've tended to try to change the people and their belief system and an expectation that uh, we would get the results we wanted. So basically, our, our mental model is you build a structure to facilitate the action you want, you build metrics, you communicate to people the targets, you give them feedback, you use feed forward to improve the process, and you try and make it transparent. And if you can do that, you tend to be very successful. Okay, so what about if you have a high-performing group that's, uh, that's doing very well? How do you get that out? How do you share that task of knowledge? Well, it turns out going and asking them doesn't always uh, externalize what you need to know uh, because what they think may be the driver may not be the driver. And so Nanaka describes the process when you get people into an area, you have them share their practices, uh, you may be doing uh, value stream mapping, 
is actually a whole discipline called lead user uh, uh, user techniques to harvest the implicit knowledge here and make it more explicit. You then uh, test it on some other people. You do a prototype. Uh, and then you want to start the cycle again around. And I don't have a very good example of this because I don't think we do it very well. But here's uh, an example from 2008, these APDRGs. This is the plot of coefficient of variation. And it was 124%. So this is standard deviation divided by mean around infarct. And when we looked at the systems, these are box and whisker plots. You can see these two systems are doing well. This one will discard since they don't have an emergency room. Uh, this one was doing well. These two, three were struggling. And uh, the next slide, we'll, we'll look at how these two compare. So if you plot the cumulative percentage of the day discharge, you see here that this uh, site was getting 20% more patients out on the third day uh, than the other site. And uh, what we did is we got grouped people from each of the sites in the room and actually went through a developing a standard work. And what became apparent in the discussion here, and it just sort of inadvertently blurted out, the site that was doing very well, were the occupational physical therapist and speech therapist were seeing the stroke patients on the day of admission if they came in early where the other sites were waiting for the orders to come through, and they were seeing them the next day. Next day. Now, as a physician, you, you, you need all of these assessments, really, then, to begin to plan a discharge plan. And uh, what the site that was doing this and had the better outcomes is they, they left buffer space in the therapist's schedule during the day uh, based on what their historical demand capacity was and they would uh, pick up and fill, fill that. And it may not be a stroke patient. It may have been an orthopedic patient or things along that line. And what happened with that is here is a control chart going back to 2008. Uh, you can see there was a drop, and the variation is less. This wasn't the only thing that was done. We also started feeding back individual physician data uh, to the individual physicians. So this is really a multiple intervention. Uh, one thing uh, that uh, control charts are very good. The problem with using them in healthcare are two. Uh, they were designed for sampling, where you had the stable denominator over the course, and that creates some, uh, some problems with using them. There are correction factors of doing that. Uh, the other thing is seasonality. Now, it didn't make a difference here, but sometimes the drops that you're seeing are really uh, seasonal. And uh, I'd be interested if anybody on the call has uh, worked out a way of dealing with that. So guiding principles, two types of knowledge, conceptual, procedural, different areas of the brain. Uh, they perform different functions. If you want to use the environment to change procedural, you're best using the active interface. Learning happens in the body through repetition. There are examples of just one time burning, uh, memories get burned into you. Uh, you all can probably remember where you were at 9-11. I can remember where I was when JFK was shot. But those tend to be the exception. I would submit to you we tend not to create that emotional value charge to it when we have people in a, in a classroom, unless the consequence is if you don't do it at the time, there's an immediate consequence that's adverse to either themselves or the patient. And the interventions need to be uh, focused on the level of uh, the type of knowledge that you're trying to change. And I will stop there for questions. Thanks, Ed. This is terrific. I appreciate it. Um, yeah. There's a question that uh, came up. Um, it is, can watching an audience member practice a teaching point act as a surrogate for other audience members who are not actually doing the activity? So the, uh, I, I think it depends what it is. So uh, one, one way of, uh, that I've used that I've found is successful is you have three people. You have one pe person that's an observer. Uh, and this may be doing like patient satisfaction or something along that line. 
and one is the customer and one is the provider. And I think the observer does learn things, but I think they're learning in a model and they're not necessarily learning in procedure. Now, if you have a good understanding of the model, practice is a little bit easier, but no, I, I think you really have to do the task. Okay, thanks. Uh, just a reminder, if people have questions, you can type it in on the question box and uh, we'll get those uh, responses uh, while we're live. And also, if you think of questions later on, I'll send them to Ed and see if we can't get you some um, responses. A uh, question I have, Ed, is when you were talking about the different uh, types of memory and you had that memory tree, uh, there are some distinctions about working memory and hardwire memory. Is that essentially the same thing that you're talking about? Uh, yeah, I can go back to that, I think. Uh, yeah, so uh, working memory requires a lot of frontal lobe work. That's where you're holding things in memory, and uh, so if you're you're trying to solve a problem, uh, and it is short term, it doesn't stay there as opposed to getting in long term. And now working memory is is not as robust as people think. Uh, the fellow named Klein has done a lot of work on this, and uh, it turns out that we can probably have three variables. And, or maybe four max and move them around. Anything that's more complicated than that, we really cannot do adequately in, in, uh, in short-term me uh, working memory. Okay, thank you. Um, here, another question I was thinking of is, uh, there's a saying that maybe you've heard is, is it's easier to act your way into a new way of thinking than think your way into a new way of acting, um, a term that's being used in a lot of the lean circles. Um, yeah. Uh, what, I, what I've noticed is, is is people are trying to get people to behave differently, and they're, they seem to be focusing primarily on uh, doing the tasks, um, uh, you know, following some of the routines, whatever. Um, what are your thoughts on what needs to change as far as some of the fundamental concepts um, uh, about the why we're doing what we're doing? Yeah. So, it, again, going back to the the re-engineering uh, buzz that occurred in the in the 90s, that was, it, it, there was this huge boost in productivity that we've yet to see, I think, in education, healthcare, or government. And basically, they primarily changed the, the processes, and, uh, and it was primarily using uh, computers to, to facilitate human-to-human -human interaction. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas until recently we've used them primarily as data repositories, but I I I, I think it's it's you need to do do some uh, cognitive or semantic preparation so people understand. You need to deal with the fear, the change, all of that. But I think we spend too much time doing that and and not get into actually the rope based. Uh, task learning. And when you do that, uh, people develop their own cognitive insights. They begin to, to, to embody their own mental model. Okay, thanks. Uh, one, of the, um, one of the questions I was thinking of is, is uh, it goes back to the bicycle example. It seems like uh, we grew up in a world and uh, learned uh, either formally or, or what we were observing, and it was like learning to ride that bike, and we developed habits as far as management, such as focusing on the parts, looking for linear cause and effect, command and control, and those sorts of things. And it seems like now what we're asking people to do is ride a fundamentally different bike, which is um, not the same principles of management that are, are, uh, are needed. Uh, do you think that's a useful way to think about that? Uh, absolutely, and I think you you have a lot of lot of examples of that in the sense that I, I know in our, our organization, uh, as Lean was adopted, people could articulate the principles, articulate the practice, but you get in a meeting or a problem solving situation or a crisis and all the behaviors were still uh, command control parts, fixed parts, and uh, measure processes, uh, process measures on the parts, and not looking at the outcome of the whole system. 
Yeah, sounds very tough to learn that new bike and then um, stay on that new bike. Yeah, and uh, it's very easy to, when a habit is new to slip back in the old way of being. And unless you have uh, the social network to, you know, bring that to light, you, next thing you know, you're you're back in totally into your old habits. Mm -hmm. Here's another question, and then maybe we'll be wrapping up. Um, how can the active interface principle be applied to increase compliance with cleaning shared equipment, for example, or uh, in between patient use? Yeah, yeah, that that's a uh, that's a challenge, and and uh, uh, most of you have probably gone to we you know in the past we used uh, yeah you need to give people feedback. Like, if you don't get any feedback, you assume you're doing the appropriate uh, function uh, at a satisfactory level. So we were using uh, glow germ, and, you know, people would clean, you know, a chair or an IV pole, and you'd go in and shine the light on it, and uh, that was feedback. And then when we started using the biological, I can't remember what the test is, but it's basically a test for bacterial uh, uh, DNA, we were showing that uh, in those settings where we thought we were 100%, we were only about uh, 60%. But mm -hmm. I think you need the feedback. And I think uh, <clears throat> what, what we tend to uh, try to do is take too many measures. Uh, I think when you have somebody that's in training, you need to give them frequent feedback so they embody the habits and to know how much rubbing and how hard to rub is actually successful. Uh, if we do that successfully, we tend then to move on, but you need to give periodic feedback to reinforce it, because if, uh, you know, for a variety of reasons, whether it be time pressure or things like that, things slip a little bit, and you don't give the person feedback, they think they're still doing a good job. Mm-hmm. That reminds me. Go ahead. Yeah, as a, as a physician, I spent most of my career driving a car that had no gauges. Mm -hmm. I didn't know if I was going too fast, too slow, and periodically you ran out of gas with no warning. <laughs> that's a good example. Well, I think that's a great note to close on. Uh, Ed, I want to thank you for your, taking the time to put this together and presenting. I will be sending a uh, link of the recording out to the participants. It will also be on our HVN collaboration website as a link. I'm going to include links to those videos that you shared, and people can uh, watch them again. I think they're both terrific videos, great learning points. And um, Scripps is a part of the uh, Healthcare Value Network, and uh, there will be future opportunities to learn. Uh, with Ed and from Ed and the others uh, from Scripps. So I want to thank everyone for their time today. And again, thank you, Ed, for taking the time to do this for me. You're welcome, Mike. All right. Hope everyone Thanks. has a good day. Thanks a lot.